Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so I was asked to talk about abiotic production of oxidants. So I'm going to be following on from Stephanie's excellent talk, where she walked through a whole bunch of um, green flags and red flags for methane um, false positives. So I'm going to do the same now for oxygen false positives. So oxygen, as I'm sure you're well aware, is the best studied and best known biosignature of our planet. It's produced by the dominant metabolism of our planet, oxygenic photosynthesis. Um, oxygenic photosynthesis, we think evolved quite early on in our planet's history, as you heard earlier. Um, we think it evolved during the Archean, even before oxygen levels rose to appreciable abundances in our atmosphere. The overwhelming majority of oxygen in our atmosphere is, of course, biological, like overwhelmingly. Um, the majority is biological. There are small photochemical sources of oxygen, but they are vastly, vastly outweighed on our planet by, photo, um, by um, uh, biological production. I used to be the uh, planetarium coordinator at the University of Washington, and I would sometimes talk about Earth during planetarium shows, and when I'd ask the kids, you know, what is Earth's atmosphere made of? They'd always say, oxygen! Because oxygen is so important to us, and nobody thinks of poor nitrogen, right? So oxygen is the gas that we think about when we think about what we're breathing, because it keeps us alive, right? It is such a fundamental gas um, to our species' survival and evolution of complex life, um, and produces strong spectral signatures because it is so abundant in our atmosphere. It also has a photochemical byproduct, O3, or ozone. And ozone is handy because ozone has even stronger spectral signatures than oxygen. You can actually detect ozone at um, concentrations that are much, much smaller than you require to detect oxygen itself. So ozone is a really, really useful and sensitive proxy for detecting super low abundances of oxygen. Okay, but you know, stepping aside from all of that, what I now want to talk about are ways of forming oxygen in planetary atmospheres abiotically. And I know you've heard some discussion of this over the course of the week, so I want to go through now these various abiotic sources of methane, or sorry, of oxygen, um, and talk through how we might recognize them if we saw a planet that has these sources. And a really, um, well, two great papers if you want to read more about this. Um, there's two papers by Vicki Meadows. Um, two review papers, um, one Meadows 2017 and Meadows 2018 is from the same series of papers that Nikki was referring to at the beginning of her talk, um, which is, you know, a, a very excellent series of papers that review bi uh, biosignatures. The importance of thinking about false positives was um, emphasized in the recent National Academy of Sciences Exoplanet Science Strategy Report, where they specifically called out the fact that when we're thinking about biosignature detection on exoplanets, we cannot turn our backs on thinking about false positives and their observational discriminants. It absolutely, always 100% has to go hand in hand with our considerations of biosignatures themselves. Now, you may have seen this figure before. Um, this figure is frequently shown. So um, this is from the Keys Review paper. And this is showing a overview. Maybe I'll switch my hand to this other mic so I can walk around, even though I don't have pockets. Um, let's see. So this is showing you an overview of all of the processes that um, can produce oxygen from various sources, right? So. Um, we have Earth here on the left-hand side, and I'm going to walk through each of these panels and talk about all of these different sources of oxygen and their red flags that you don't want to see if you're trying to think about whether the oxygen is biological or not. Um, I'm going to actually start in the middle of this figure. So I'm going to start by talking about ocean loss processes and massive water loss processes and how those might lead to oxygen false positives. Okay, so let's say you're a happy, carefree planet with oceans of liquid water happily minding your own business, and your star starts to get really nasty and bright and luminous. Well, what's the planet to do in that case? You might not be able to hold on to those oceans, so your oceans may start to massively evaporate until you have a desiccated surface environment and a very hot, wet atmosphere. When you have an extremely hot atmosphere, that water vapor, um, it can't condense into clouds anymore. So you're basically, um, so on Earth what we have is um, at the top of the lowest atmospheric layer that's called the troposphere, we have a layer called the tropopause where water condenses into clouds and it rains back out to the planet's surface. 
Now, that's called the cold trap in our atmosphere. For an extremely hot atmosphere, you don't have that anymore. So your water vapor, you know, it, it goes up into the stratosphere. You have a very wet stratosphere, and you have water hanging out near the edge of space, where it becomes vulnerable to photolysis. And when you photolyze that water, well, for a terrestrial planet, um, you know, a rocky small planet, hydrogen is not, you know, you just don't hold on to hydrogen. It's easily lost. So the hydrogen escapes to space. And what happens to that oxygen that gets left behind? Well, what I've just described to you is what we think happened to Venus in the past. We think Venus may have once been habitable, maybe. We have evidence that it may have had uh, liquid water in its past. And now we see this hellish desiccated surface environment with chemical remnant signatures of that water in the atmosphere. But we don't see oxygen in Venus's atmosphere, right? We don't see a rich oxygen atmosphere. So what happened to that oxygen that must have been left behind if Venus did indeed undergo massive ocean loss? Well, oxygen, you know, it really likes to get friendly with other molecules. It really likes to react with everything. So um, this oxygen could have reacted with the crust and the mantle of the planet. That could have actually been a huge oxygen sink for the free oxygen that was produced in this process. Um, there's a paper, Chassel here in 1996, um, which estimated that the surface and mantle of Venus could have absorbed the O2 that was produced from ocean loss for up to 0.45 times one Earth ocean worth of water. And so that may be where the, um, where the oxygen went um, when Venus lost its oxygen. Okay, so I'll return to Venus in a bit, but now I want to talk about exoplanets explicitly um, in a little bit of detail. So we've thought a lot about uh, M-dwarf exoplanets and potentially habitable exoplanets orbiting M-dwarfs, which are wonderful because they're easy to observe. But um, I get a little bit disturbed when I think about them because they have, it appears, a relatively high potential for exhibiting oxygen false positives compared to planets orbiting more solar-type stars. Now, one of the mechanisms that can produce oxygen false positives for M dwarf planets is massive water loss. And that's even for planets in their habitable zone. This is a figure um, from a paper by uh, Rodrigo Luger and Rory Barnes, where they are showing the evolution of the inner edge of the habitable zone as a function of time on the bottom axis here. The habitable zone is not a static Thing. And planetary habitability is not a static property that planets have. Planets can lose habitability or even gain, potentially, could gain habitability over time. And for these M dwarfs, these low mass stars, they, um, when they're contracting onto the main sequence, which for the non astronomers in the room, the main sequence is um, where stars spend most of their lives burning hydrogen fuel. And that's when they actually start to shine with their own energy. But prior to that, when they're collapsing from that massive cloud of gas and dust, they're very luminous because they're extremely large. And that collapsation time scale, it's called the superluminous pre-main sequence time scale, lasts a lot longer for low mass stars compared to higher mass stars like sun-like stars. So on this figure, um, these different contours correspond to different stellar masses. An M8 star is at the bottom and the sun-like star is at the top you can see that the sun settles down a lot earlier compared to an M8 star like, say, Trappist-1. And so what this means is that the inner edge of the habitable zone starts, you know, quite a bit farther out than it ends up at for these late M dwarf stars. And so if you have a planet that's orbiting within what will ultimately be the habitable zone of these stars, they're going to spend actually a lot of time inside the habitable zone potentially up to a billion years in the case of a star like Trappist-1. And that's really not a friendly thing when you think about holding on to water and not being coming completely desiccated. So these exoplanets, for example, like the Trappist planet, orbiting in the habitable zone, if they formed there, if it, um, or if they've been in the habitable zone long enough and they haven't received late volatile delivery, they could actually be exo-Venus planets, even the planets in the habitable zone. And so this is a concern a lot of people have about these planets orbiting M dwarfs. And what's even more concerning is that these planets orbiting M dwarfs in the habitable zone might actually have massive amounts of oxygen that's abiotically produced in their atmospheres through massive water loss processes. People have estimated that they could actually have hundreds, even thousands of bars of oxygen. So um, these 
bars of oxygen were calculated um, by Rodrigo Luger, um, but they're not accounting for you know, subsequent sinks of oxygen and say the crust or the mantle. So you know, these levels could go down from there, but you, you, know, you could still, depending on it, how much water you're losing, build up massive quantities of water in your planetary atmosphere. And if you fill up your, all of your oxygen sinks, you can continue to sustain that oxygen in your atmosphere for long time scales. Now, of course, these planets are not habitable. So that's good because we're not going to see water and water is something that we're going to look for, of course, and try to evaluate habitability and whether we're actually thinking a planet is habitable or not. So good <laughs> because we wouldn't be fooled into thinking these are habitable worlds. Um, so that's one red flag. Another red flag are these oxygen dimers that will appear in your spectrum for very high concentrations of oxygen. So um, here is a figure from a paper by Eddie Schwederman showing these two oxygen dimers. So oxygen dimers are collisionally induced absorption features. They occur when the oxygen molecules collide with each other. And um, we've got a feature here, and we've got a feature here. So they've, they've got this interesting sort of, you know, kind of like a witch's hat from Harry Potter shape. Um, and these oxygen dimers appear strongly when you have massive amounts of oxygen in your planetary atmosphere. So this, for example, is an atmosphere with 100 bars of oxygen, which you might be able to get if you lose, you know, a couple of Earth oceans worth of water. So in summary, for this particular type of false positive, ocean loss can create false positive O2 even in the habitable zone for planets orbiting Endorf. But we can we think we can distinguish this from truly, you know, biological O2 via lack of water features because, well, we need to see water to determine whether a planet is habitable and also especially from the presence of these oxygen dimers, which should only occur for um, abundances of oxygen that are just massively off the charts. Um, we're only going to see those dimers strongly in those cases. Okay, so next I'm going to spend some time talking about um, that side of this plot. Um, and talk through some scenarios where you can form um, oxygen from CO2 photolysis. So um, this is a slide that I got from Mike Wong, who's here in the audience. Um, I saw him give this presentation at PsyCon and asked for his slides uh, afterwards. So um, you can form O2 from CO2 photolysis. So you can photolyze that CO2, but you don't readily reform CO2 once you do that because the recombination reaction is thin forbidden. You need a catalyst to make it go faster. In the absence of a catalyst, you can wind up with a whole bunch of um, abiotically O2 produced from this reaction. And endorphs in particular are troubling in this case because endorphs emit a lot of radiation at the wavelengths where CO2 is photolyzed, which is indicated with this gray bar here. Now, this effect is particularly efficient for desiccated planets that have lost their water orbiting, um, you know, orbiting any type of star, really, because OH radicals that are sourced from water vapor can um, catalyze formation of CO and O back to CO2. So if you have a totally desiccated planet, this can occur more readily. Fortunately, a totally desiccated planet is not one we would identify as habitable in the first place. But what about planets that do have water vapor? So there might be planets out there that have a lot of CO2 in their atmospheres and also have water vapor in their atmospheres, and we might think they're habitable. What happens then? Well, when people started to look at this problem with photochemical models, um, they ran into a photochemical puzzle. Um, there were two studies uh, published around the same time um, by Feng Tian and Sunny Harman, and they found that planets around these UV active stars can accumulate detectable levels of photochemical oxygen from CO2 photolysis, even in atmospheres containing water. There was another study that was also published contemporaneously with these other two um, by Shonda Goldman, who suggested um, you weren't actually forming enough O2 from this process for the O2 itself to be detectable, um, but maybe you, could also, maybe you could actually detect the O3 um, which is a photochemical byproduct of O2 that becomes detectable at much lower concentration, right? So in this case, the oxygen was, you know, you were forming photochemical oxygen, but it was forming much, much less readily. In these two cases, you were forming photochemical oxygen fast enough that you were actually being able to detect it in your planetary spectra. So, you know, what, what was going on? Why were these studies coming up with these different results? What was happening? 
Um, well, Sunny Harmon figured out what was happening, and I totally respect this because I run photochemical models myself, and I know how complicated they are and how many knobs there are to turn in these models. So um, what Sunny found was that um, lightning makes a big difference. And, um, the models that were accumulating large amounts of O2 did not have lightning turned on in the model. And so when you turn on lightning, when you flip that switch in the model, it actually forms enough NO catalysts that are sufficient to um, reform that CO2 from CO and O that's produced in those reactions. So good job to Sunny for figuring that out. Um, it makes a big difference. So here's some figures um, from Sunny's paper. Um, the left is with lightning turned off, and on the right is with lightning turned on. And you can see that when you turn on the lightning, it makes a huge difference. Right? These curves are all shifting towards lower values for these abiotically produced oxygen species. So these, you know, these phenomena that you might not think are relevant to biological production of you know whatever gas or abi abiotic production of whatever gas like lightning and you know, they can actually make a difference so when we're thinking about false positives and the mechanisms that can produce them or mitigate them we really do have to think about planets holistically and think about all of the different processes that occur on planets okay so going back to this idea of abiotic o2 from co2 photolysis um, you've heard about CO. Um, CO is an important gas that we might be looking for in exoplanet atmospheres as potentially a sign of, well, maybe false positive oxygen being produced because CO is also produced from CO2 photolysis. So Eddie Sweeterman looked at the detectability of CO. Um, so here are some of his um, model runs. Um, you can see that CO is producing um, some spectral features at about 2.3 and somewhere around 4.7 microns. So if you see a planet with CO2 and a lot of CO in the atmosphere, well, that, that might be an indicator that that CO is getting uh, photochemically produced from CO2 photolysis. And so that might make you very suspicious if you see a planet with a high level of CO. But as Stephanie was saying, uh, you know, things might be complicated. Uh, you could also look for methane. As Stephanie was alluding to earlier, methane and oxygen are like cats and dogs and they fight each other in the atmosphere. And so if you have a lot of methane in your planetary atmosphere and you have a lot of oxygen, they, you, know, you need high production rates of both of these things in order to sustain them at high levels. And um, what this plot is showing is on the y-axis, it's showing the column abundance of O2 and O3 in the different colors. And on the x-axis, it's showing the column density of CH4 or methane. And you can see as you're increasing the amount of methane in your planetary atmosphere, your abundance of abiotically photochemically produced O2 and O3 from CO2 photolysis is decreasing because the methane is eating it up, right? Or the oxygen is um, reacting with that methane very, very rapidly. And so at the rates that we anticipate being able to produce abiotic um, oxygen and ozone from CO2 photolysis, if you increase your amount of methane, you may be able to draw those levels down. So more methane means less abiotic O2 and O3 accumulating in your planetary atmosphere. So in summary for this false positive, uh, CO2 photolysis can create false positive O3 on CO2-rich planets orbiting UV active stars, particularly M-dwarfs. This is a problem for it. Um, but you may be able to distinguish this false positive from the presence of strong CO features that could indicate that you have a lot of uh, CO2 photolysis going on. And also if you see methane that makes the presence of a, uh, abiotic O2 less likely because that, um, that methane can gobble up that uh, abiotic O2. Okay, so let's go back to Venus for a bit now, as I promised that we would do. Um, so Venus has a CO2 rich atmosphere, right? There's tons of CO2 in Venus's atmosphere. It has a 90 bar atmosphere that's like 95% CO2. So this should be occurring, right? And this is in fact occurring in Venus's atmosphere. And we know this is occurring in Venus's atmosphere because we can see oxygen in Venus's atmosphere. So these are some observations of oxygen air glow at 1.27 microns observed um, on Venus. Um, this was from ground-based observations with the Apache Point Observatory Telescope in New Mexico um, from two consecutive nights back in 2009. The blotchy pattern that you're seeing, so you're looking at the dark side of Venus here, and the bright blotchy pattern that you're seeing is actually air glow from excited oxygen emitting photons at 1.27 microns on Venus. What happens is on the day side of Venus, that CO2 gets photolyzed, 
it creates oxygen. That oxygen eventually cycles around to the night side of the planet, eventually sinks deeper into the mesosphere of Venus's atmosphere. It recombines into excited oxygen, and as it relaxes to the ground state, it emits these photons that create this you know, beautiful distribution of light that we see here that's very highly spatially and temporally variable. Yet, despite the fact that we have seen now we've seen the smoking gun of excited oxygen in Venus's atmosphere, and people have studied it extensively. We've never seen ground state oxygen in Venus's atmosphere. Right? So what's going on with that? Something must be removing it extremely rapidly. Um, so uh, at Abscicon a couple weeks ago, I saw Mike Guan give a talk about what might be going on there. So we think what might be scrubbing out uh, that um, uh, oxygen from Venus's atmosphere might be chlorine chemistry. So chlorine can catalyze the formation of um, the oxygen and the CO back into CO2. And this is quite complex and it's also um, intertwined with sulfur chemistry in Venus's atmosphere. So chlorine chemistry and sulfur chemistry, um, you know, combine into this complex network of chemical reactions that occur that can, um, as a net result, reform um, that CO2 back from the free oxygen that you produce. Now going back to thinking about M-dwarfs, uh, M-dwarfs like say TRAPPIST-1 produce a lot of far UV radiation where you photolyze CO2 um, and this is important when thinking about the, um, what might happen for an exo-Venus orbiting around these different kinds of planets. What um, Mike found in his results when he uh, ran his photochemical model was that for n dwarfs, you can actually generate a lot more abiotic oxygen in this context. So um, this is showing on the y-axis the uh, column mixing ratio of O2 that's abiotically produced from CO2 photolysis, and then on the x-axis is the amount of um, SO2 in the atmosphere. And you can see quite strikingly, especially for a star like TRAPPIST-1, you can get you know, quite appreciable levels of abiotic oxygen in these planetary atmospheres because that CO2 photolysis um, is proceeding very, very efficiently. So that CO2 photolysis is proceeding too efficiently for these catalyst, catalytic recombination to occur to um, you know, put that uh, uh, oxygen back into CO2. And also the um, uh, chlorine and um, the clock species that you need in, um, and the SOX species that you need in order to catalyze that recombination are not formed as readily for those M-dwarf stars. So the net effect is, again, M-dwarfs seem to be, apparently seem to be prone to abiotic oxygen buildup. So in summary, Venus-like planets around stars like TRAPPIST-1, and again, Venus-like planets might exist in the habitable zone for these kinds of stars may be prone to abiotic O2 buildup because they can form this abiotic O2 from CO2 photolysis, but they're not as efficient at um, recom recombining that back into CO2. Okay, so in the last couple minutes, I wanna talk about um, this false positive here. Um, this false positive to me is the most disturbing of all false positives. Like if there's one false positive that keeps me up at night, it's this false positive. And the reason why is because um, the other false positives that I described have to do with star-planet interactions, and they're much more commonly occurring on planets orbiting low-mass M-dwarf stars. But this particular false positive has more to do with the properties of the planet's atmosphere itself, more so than the star-planet interaction. So it can occur for any kind of star. So if any planet or any star, this could happen. And that, to me, is a little bit disturbing. Um, what causes this is planets with low pressure atmospheres or low amounts of non-condensable gases in their atmosphere. So let's say you have a planet with a low pressure atmosphere with water on the surface. Now, if you have a low pressure atmosphere, if the pressure is sufficiently low, you might not actually be able to condense that water into clouds. You might not form a cold trap. And as I alluded to earlier in the talk, if you're not forming a cold trap, you can have water hanging out near the edge of space. So if you have water hanging out near the edge of space because it hasn't condensed out deeper down into your atmosphere, you can photolyze that water and then you can lose that hydrogen to space. So what happens to the O2 in that case? Well, you know, it may, there may be O2 sinks that could remove it from the atmosphere. Um, but if you fill up those O2 sinks, like for example, if you, if you oxidize the mantle, you could have O2 sustained over geological time scales on such a planet. 
And remember, this could occur for any kind of star. It just has to do with the pressure of the planetary atmosphere. So if you have a sufficiently low pressure, this can happen. Now, one, um, you know, red, huge red flag that would, you know, diagnose this false positive is if that water vapor loss occurs to completion and you don't see signs of water vapor in the atmosphere, well then, you're not gonna think that planet is habitable anyway, so that's okay. Um, right, so no H2O, not habitable anyway, so why do you even care about this planet? Um, well, you might compare, care for other reasons, but not for um, biosignature reasons. Um, but what if there is still water? Well, if there is still water, then you're gonna wanna try to constrain the atmospheric pressure, right? So it might be possible to constrain the pressure of the atmosphere um, from observations. So here's a plot from Kat Fang's work. Um, where she's showing a retrieval from a spectrum where these uh, different SNR values are for um, SNR of the spectrum at 550, nan uh, 550 um, nanometers. And so she's just showing that in principle, it may be possible to retrieve surface pressure from planetary spectra, although it may be quite challenging to do that. Um, we may also be able to go after features like, say, um, this is an oxygen dimer feature. This is another paper by Eddie Schwederman, where he was um, looking at uh, this feature, which is present at around four microns, this feature, um, this dimer feature is, again, these dimers are collisionally induced absorption features, and they're very sensitive to the amount of a gas in the planetary atmosphere. So if you assume that N2 is the dominant background gas for your planet's atmosphere, you might be able to go after this feature to try to say something about the pressure of the planet's atmosphere. And lastly, there is a poster hanging up in the poster hall right now um, by Mel Curry from the University of Washington. And it talks about how you might be able to use high resolution spectra to diagnose this particular false positive. If you use high resolution spectra, you might actually be able to say something about the um, uh, vertical profile of that water. So if that water is getting photochemically produced high up, you might expect there to be more of, uh, sorry, uh, oxygen, you might expect there to be more oxygen high up than deep down in the atmosphere. And so if you can infer something about the vertical profile of that water, or keep saying water, oxygen um, from a high resolution spectrum, that might help you diagnose this false positive. So go check out that poster. So in summary, for this uh, type of uh, false positive, low pressure atmospheres might generate abiotic photochemical O2, but you might be able to distinguish this using measurements of surface pressure and maybe high resolution spectroscopy. Okay, so just to sum up with a few um, closing words, O2 is still a robust biosignature, despite everything that I've just said. We still think O2 is a good biosignature, but for all biosignatures, you have to rule out false positives. This is not just for O2, this is for every biosignature. And luckily, we think that O2 has um, telltale giveaways or red flags for these false positives. But in order to search for these, for any biosignature, you have to carefully consider that biosignature in the context of its environment. You can't just measure you know, a narrow piece of the spectrum with oxygen and say, oh, I found a biosignature, I'm done. You have to actually measure you know, a complete spectrum of that planet and try to understand as much about the planet as you can. Otherwise, you could be fooled. And that's it. So the, the question is how massive are the atmospheres for these different scenarios with different abiotic oxygen abundances? Um, so it varies. Um, if I go back to say this figure here, right? So um, for Earth, well, okay, ignore Earth. Um, for a low pressure atmosphere, right, you're going to have less mass in your planetary atmosphere. Um, for some of these other scenarios, you could end up, um, you know, with massive amounts of atmosphere, right? So the oxygen loss scenario, um, one of the key characteristics of that oxygen loss scenario is a massive oxygen atmosphere, you know, potentially hundreds to thousands of bars of oxygen. So that's much more massive than Earth's atmosphere today. It's more massive than Venus's atmosphere is, in fact. Um, Venus's atmosphere is only something like 90 bars. Um, we're not thinking, though, about, like, mini-Neptune types of atmospheric masses. We're still thinking about terrestrial types 
atmospheric masses. Hi, uh, just about like the Venus case, we were talking about Venus-like atmosphere, and you said that uh, actually a lot of methane could, uh, could hide the abiotic O2. And would it be a problem to differentiate this case and a case of Archean Earth with uh, methane but no detectable O2? Um, so thinking about using methane and oxygen together to diagnose yes, this yes. false positive ice signature. So um, no. Um, so the, the methane, I mean, so in these cases, the O2 is not actually, the O2 and the O3 is not detectable when you have large amounts of uh, methane in the atmosphere. As Stephanie was talking about earlier, you can, it's not a problem to just have detectable methane and not detectable O2 or O3 when thinking about biosignatures. Like you could look for um, this equilibrium pairs of methane and CO2, for example, then for um, biological methane. Now, the methane in this case doesn't necessarily have to be biological. Um, like you could get this, you know, depending on how much methane you want in these atmospheres. You, just need abiotic fluxes. And I think in particular, when Sean was running these, I think he was just thinking about um, volcanic fluxes of, um, of methane for these cases. So really, it's always thinking about these fluxes that you need in order to produce the concentrations that you see in an atmosphere. If you see a given concentration of a gas, you need to think about what are the source fluxes that I need in order to sustain that concentration, and are they too high to be plausible from abiotic fluxes? So, um, yeah, I, I don't think it's a problem at all to um, just have methane and not also have detectable in O2 and O3. <laughs> um, the, these 100 bar uh, oxygen atmospheres, what happens to the carbon? What happens to the... Well, so you'd still probably have a lot of CO2 in those atmospheres. Um, so, I don't think that... Um, I'm trying to remember what Rodrigo did in this paper. I don't think they were actually including CO2 outgassing in their model, but you would expect on a planet that is a terrestrial, you know, a terrestrial Earth-ish or Venus-ish planet, you're going to have CO2 outgassing or, you know, some sort of carbon-like outgassing. And so I would expect over long time periods, you would end up with, you know, a mantle that has outgassed the contents of its CO2. So we think Venus has outgassed basically all of the CO2 in its mantle. That's why it has a 90 bar atmosphere. So um, these types of planets that have massive oxygen atmospheres probably have a lot of CO2 in their atmospheres as well. Um, probably. So anyway, thank you, Jada. That was really, really excellent. Um, for the scary low pressure atmosphere scenario, for which one, Aki? The, the one that keeps you up at night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, does that planet have clouds at all? It shouldn't. Yeah, so that's another way that we might be able to um, if I go back to it. I think, I think I had a slide where I called out the lack of clouds. Maybe not. Um, yeah, so that planet would not have clouds. Um, that planet, if it... If you're not condensing your water, you're not going to have clouds. So if you see water in your atmospheres and see no sign of clouds, that might be something that disturbs you when you look at a particular planet. Okay, so can I assume, though, that, so that there's any planet that's experienced that's building up oxygen through um, water dissociation and hydrogen loss would not have clouds? Not have water clouds? <laughs> any planet that has O2 from like the mountain. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. I guess the problem is, can you tell the difference between different types of clouds? In theory, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I know people have looked at um, CO2 clouds versus water clouds and the different spectral signatures that they produce. I don't know what the results of those studies were. Perhaps someone in the audience remembers. Um, yeah. So maybe if you guys want to continue with that, 